Et je suis très content d'être ici avec euh, vous tous et toutes. Et... Et je suis très fier de euh, faire partie de la première conférence d'AGS depuis COVID. Yeah? Oui? So good morning. I, this is a lot easier now. I'm very excited to be here and honored to be a part of the first .js post-COVID. I think we can all agree that is a good thing. Round of applause just for being back for .js. And maybe one additional thing that we can agree on is that uh, full-stack web development is an absolute mess. I mean, if we, if we think about full-stack web development, uh, we have to do a lot of different things. This is intentionally zoomed out for dramatic effect, but uh, what this is, is front end, it's back end, it's DevOps. And if we start to zoom in just a little bit on the front end side, we have to know HTML, CSS, uh, JavaScript, Git, GitHub, source control, NPM, all these things. And if we zoom in just a little bit more, we have this pick a framework section. And it's interesting, there are six different frameworks listed here, and we probably all know in the JavaScript ecosystem there are many more than this, and that can be a little overwhelming. And you may have heard the joke about uh, JavaScript frameworks, maybe you have, maybe you haven't. If you, uh, to create a JavaScript framework, all you need to do is pick a word and then add .js to it. So I picked my favorite French word, which is uh, grand oui, and created uh, grand oui JS. And this is intended to be the last framework you will ever need. So the tagline is to stop framework hopping. There, should, there we go, okay. I didn't know if that would resonate or not, so we'll, we'll go with it. So I, I, I kind of joke about this, but I love JavaScript, mostly. It's kind of a hard one to be in love with consistently because we're so distracted. There's always a new framework, there's always a new best practice, there's always a new opinion, and as JavaScript developers, we're constantly chasing this new thing. And as a content creator, that's what I do. I love to create content on the latest and greatest of things that come out. But it just feels like we're circling and we're chasing our tail. It feels like we're going in circles. What was old is new, what's new is old. And it's just hard to keep up and it's overwhelming. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. So my name is James Quick. I am a developer, a speaker, and a teacher, and I've done some combination of those three things professionally now for about 10 years. And what I've realized in my career is I create all this content because I love to teach. I love to empower developers to build. And uh, JavaScript became my gateway to building uh, back in about 2016. So I want to share, I'll give you a little, little personal uh, couple of notes about me. I want to share two fun facts about me. One is that I can solve a Rubik's Cube, and I used to say under a minute. It's probably about under two minutes because I haven't done it in a while. I actually did it live at a meetup the other day. I don't have one now. So. And the second is that I'm a huge fan of the author Dan Brown. And you may have heard of uh, The Da Vinci Code, which actually takes place. Uh, at least partially in Paris, and I have gone and searched out all of those uh, sites when I visited Paris in the past. But one book you may not know as much from Dan Brown is Inferno. And this references a lot Dante's Inferno, which references in turn the nine levels or circles of hell. And honestly, when I think about this chasing our tail and circling around, this is what came to mind. So we're going to walk through these nine different stages or circles of hell, and we're going to use a scoring chart that is completely arbitrary, has little demons for, for scores. And I'm going to use this. It's not perfect. There are a million different caveats. So if you have a question, if you want to talk more about it later, uh, we'll do that after. But this is a way for us to compare and contrast and talk through where we started and where we are today and why. So, abandon all hope, ye who enter here. We'll start with the creation of the web. So back in 1996, the, um, 1989, excuse me, the web was born with Tim Berners-Lee. 
And this was the foundation for how we share information today. We are more connected as people than we have ever been thanks to the web. And this is, this is a really big deal for many reasons, one of which is this is the reason that we get to play video games while we work from home now. So we are enabled because of that. But the web isn't the web without websites, something to actually inter interact with. And so the first website uh, came out in 1991, and it, uh, it looked beautiful. It was just HTML, and conveniently enough, it was a document about how the web worked. And this came out in 1991. There's, a, there's a, another really big thing that happened in 1991, and that is uh, the year I was born. So I, maybe it's fitting that now I get to be on stage a handful of years later to talk about that. And if that makes you feel old, thank you. <laughs> but I was born in 1991, which makes me a 90s baby. I'm a millennial. And to prove that, I don't know if this will resonate as much outside of the U.S., but one of my favorite movies is Space Jam from the 90s. And this, this website was released in 1996. One of the coolest HTML, CSS websites that I've ever seen. So this is what the web looked like. There wasn't really interaction. There wasn't really much you could do except for go to different pages. And then we progress into the dangerous world of JavaScript. We want to be able to add interaction to our sites. We want to give the user something to do. So JavaScript was invented in 1995. The ECMAScript standard became uh, a thing in 1997. And later, later that year, ECMAScript uh, 1 was released. And we've gone through many versions of ECMAScript up through ES6 and then on to ES2017, 18, et cetera. So we've come a long way in the JavaScript ecosystem. So the way this works at this time period, we have static HTML, CSS, and JavaScript assets. And what happens is you go to a browser. You try to go to a URL. That makes a request to, I'll say, a CDN at this point. At that point, it was just somebody's server in their garage, but we'll, we'll call it a CDN. And then from that CDN, you'll be able to access the HTML file, JavaScript file, CSS file. You'll send back markup, and then you'll render that to the page. It's pretty simple. That's probably something we're all used to. So if we look at scoring this, SEO good, performance. We're shipping this JavaScript without any like minification or anything like that probably early on. There's minimal interactiveness because we're pretty, pretty early on with JavaScript. There's not really a build time, most likely, and content is probably not very dynamic. So then we look at, like, if we have this website and as they grow and they scale, we have all these different pages that we're creating and we're kind of doing them by hand with individual HTML, CSS, JavaScript files. So what if there was a way where we didn't have to do all of that ourselves? And the answer became, why don't we let the computer do that for us? And in comes server-side rendering, which has kind of been the de facto way to do web development over the past 20 years, probably, with the exception of a few that we'll talk about. And there's a lot of frameworks and languages that really made this popular. Ruby on Rails is, is one of the most, uh, one of the ones that comes to mind most when I think of um, full stack, or excuse me, server-side rendering. PHP as a language, and then WordPress as a platform, which interestingly still covers over 40% of the web, which is really, really incredible. But we're not here to talk about WordPress. This is a JavaScript conference, so we're gonna talk about uh, the impact of Node. So Node.js, uh, was released in 2009, and what this did was allow us to write full stack applications using JavaScript. Front end to back end, we could use the same exact language. And this is something, one of the things I think to this day I am most excited about in the web is the ability to use one language to do so many things. So how this works is let's take an example where we're going uh, to a blog page, so an individual blog page. So we go to slash blog slash one or whatever that ID is. We make that request. It sends that request to the server. The server then queries the database for the record of with ID of one. And it gets back data. And then it, it somehow creates markup out of that and sends back markup. Now, you probably had like a templating language or something like that. But at the end of the day, the output from the server is markup that then gets rendered uh, in the browser. And it's actually uh, something you should pay attention to, this idea of rendering happening on the server, which in this case, I'm thinking 10, 15 years ago, actually kind of pops up. And you'll see that kind of come full circle as we move through this. So if we go in and, and rank this, SEO is good, performance is, is good, because we're not, um, 
We're, we're letting the programming take care of building these pages for us. We're not having to do a bunch of stuff manually. Interactiveness, we're still kind of early on in, in what we're doing with JavaScript. Not really a build time, like really early on. And then dynamic content, it's all coming from the database, so it's dynamic. But there's one issue with this, and that is if we go to a second page, the performance actually kind of goes down. So what I mean is if we go to the index page of a site, we're loading all the markup for that entire page. And then if we go to the next page, we're reloading all the same or potentially some of the markup, but all the markup for that page as well, including some things that didn't need to be refetched from the server. And so let's try to tackle this performance is issue, this performance concern. It's an opportunity, performance opportunity, when we navigate to that second page. And in comes either the best or the worst thing to ever happen in web development, which is single page applications. Now, single page applications don't mean there's only one page in your website. That's not the case at all. What it means is there's one page of all the JavaScript in the world that you may ever want that gets shipped with your website. Whether you use it or not, it's going to the browser. And there's obvious trade-offs with this, but it's kind of cool to look back at, at a few of the originators of single-page application uh, frameworks, Ember, Knockout, Angular, JS. But more in modern times, we think about dominance from Angular, React, and Vue. And so the way this works is we have, uh, we have a request coming from our browser to a CDN, and we get these same static assets that we did before. So that looks really similar. And then we respond back with something that can originally be, or eventually be rendered on the page. But what this doesn't cover yet is this big, massive blob of JavaScript that gets sent back. Really, really big. And so what happens is this JavaScript now, it is responsible for loading content from a server. So the JavaScript will make an API request, if we're looking for the first blog post, to API slash blog slash one, to the server, to the database, and then now from the server back to JavaScript, we're just going to return JSON. So we're just returning the data that needs to change for this new page, for example. And we ended up adding uh, what has become the worst, most hated, evil, controversial thing that has ever happened to web development, which is the loading spinner. So what happened is we would send back these static assets, the page would be loaded, and we would be sitting there watching the loader while JavaScript is going and fetching asynchronous data. And if, if you really pay attention, basically for the rest of this journey, a lot of what we talk about is looking to solve exactly that problem. It's to get rid of that spinner. So if we now kind of rank this, SEO goes down, we take a big hit on SEO because Website crawlers don't really have a great way to index things that are coming from JavaScript eventually that aren't there uh, on the initial uh, download of the HTML. So SEO takes a, a, a hit, but we fix that performance issue of going to a second page because we're no longer making a full request back to the server. We're just loading the data that we need. But if we go back to the first page, we've now sacrificed that performance hit because that first the first page now is loading much slower because there's a lot more JavaScript coming down in that bundle. So two problems, performance and SEO. And let's try to address some of those. And income static site generation. Hey, if we're going to have all these blog posts that never change, why are we querying that data dynamically? Why are we hitting the database every time? Why don't we just create those pages and have them sit there? And so some of the static site generators that I think of is kind of making this more mainstream. Gatsby, Hugo, Jekyll, Eleventy. Gatsby was my gateway to static site generators. It was all the rage on Twitter, people posting about how they recreated their website with Gatsby. And I wanted to be a part of the cool group that was doing that, and that's what I did. So the way static site generators work is you have a build time process now. And during this build time, your server is going to make a request to the database, get all the blog posts, render them into individual HTML pages, and then cache those on the CDN. Replicated worldwide, so now those individual pages are super, super fast. So when the request comes in, it just goes to the CDN, it gets those static assets, and now your page is rendered no more connecting to the database. And just in case you need to do any of that javascript -y stuff that you did before, well, you can ship JavaScript back to the browser with something called hydration, which we will ignore for a second and come back to in a few seconds. So hydration is uh, client-side JavaScript to add application state and interactivity to server-rendered HTML, 
We'll come back to that. So if we look at the score of this, we have, we fixed our SEO problem. Performance is great for these static pages, but build time and dynamic content. We have to build our site every time we want to add a new piece of content. And then that build process, because it's generating all these pages, takes a long time. So let's try to solve dynamic content. And this is where, when we were doing static site generator, generators, we thought this was the answer to everything until, until we just realized, hey, we still actually need a server involved. Then that's where hybrid rendering came in. So hybrid rendering and Nuxt.js and Next.js were two of the ones, first ones that I knew of that really did this and had it packaged together. And what this, oh, and one other thing is my favorite framework. There's lots of hybrid fr frameworks, but my favorite is Astro, just a quick shout out there. But what this did was allow us to get the best out of static site generated pages and server side rendered pages because we could just choose for individual pages which way we wanted those to be rendered. Pretty cool. So we've now fixed this dynamic content because we have the opportunity to go and query data dynamically if and when we need to, but we still have this problem of build time. Still taking a long time to build those individual pages and in comes incremental static regeneration, a term coined by Next.js. And what this looks like is we're gonna have a server during build time that's going to query a subset of our blog posts in this example, maybe just the top five. And we're going to take each of those and we're going to render them to their individual pages, but we're not going to do the rest and we'll still save those to a CDN. So we go to access blog one from the CDN, comes back fine, but what happens if we access blog six that we haven't built yet? Well, we get this question mark. This is where server-side rendering basically kicks in. We go and build that page with server-side rendering. So we get the response that we're used to here, and then we cache that so we never have to build that page again. So that page is now out there and static, available and fast for us when we need it after that point. And that's pretty cool. So we fixed a lot of these problems. The one thing that we haven't really talked about is this idea of hydration. And hydration is sending this bundle of JavaScript to do things on the browser regardless of whether you need it. And we have one other limitation, which in a hybrid framework, we have the ability at the page or route level to choose static site or render server rendered content, but we don't have the ability to go an even finer level. And that's where server components are, which we're gonna use to address performance. So server components started with React. They were probably most known uh, for being adopted by Next.js. That's where I use server components. But there are also other frameworks that implement server components as well. A couple in the uh, React ecosystem, uh, Redwood JS, and Remix, and then also I mentioned uh, Astro. They just released something called uh, Server Islands, which is a very similar and pretty unique and cool concept. And so with server components, it's going to look pretty similar, where we make a request to the server, server goes to the database, but then before the database call finishes, we send back static HTML. So we may render a, a H1 on the page. And then what's happening is that data is being loaded asynchronously on the server from the database, and when that data finally comes back, what we do is take that content and then stream it back to the browser. So the benefit of that is we have that static page, we have a quick time to first byte, and then we can dynamically load any of the additional data that we need by streaming it from the server to the client. This is pretty powerful because then you get that dynamic content to pop in. Now, when you combine this with the ability to do caching after you make one of those requests or at build time to cache these things, you're really getting a, a very detailed combination of all the things that we've talked about, and you can pick and choose when and where you want them most effectively. So we've solved this issue again. Our numbers, our, our devils, our, our ratings, they look really, really good, but if you look at this, they don't look that different from the server-side rendering scorecard that we showed early on in this presentation. So this seems like we're this dog just chasing our tail, running around in circles and trying to figure out what's, what best practices are. And there's lots of jokes and memes about this in the JavaScript ecosystem. But what you forget when you think about running around in circles is you forget this is actually a 3D circle that we're running around. We're actually running up a spiral staircase. We're, we're running around and around, but we're making progress and we're moving up the staircase. We're able to do things that we were never able to do before and solve problems that we never did. And remember, what performance means now is totally different than what performance meant 10 or 15 years ago. So this got me thinking about a trip that my wife and I took yesterday to the Pantheon, and you have to climb 203 steps to get to the top. 
My one-year-old daughter was asleep and I carried her up every step. And so I want to leave you with a quote from Inferno, which is, it is night, so Dante and Virgil are able to see once more the stars. Inferno thus concludes on a note of hope. And so my leaving thought with you is if you can make it through those 203 steps to the top with a sleeping child, if you can make it through nine levels or circles of hell, you might just come across one of the most beautiful things you've ever seen. Merci beaucoup.